Welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us for this second episode of our three-part series in the Reputation Management Playbook, Turning Every Customer Interaction into Your Competitive Advantage, presented by B2B Marketing Zone and sponsored by Reputation. I'm Tom, the webinar coordinator for B2B Marketing Zone, and I'm excited to bring you this fresh, brand new episode with hard-earned insight on how learning, sorry, how listening to your customers can help grow your business. I'm really looking forward today to talking with Adam Dorfman and Michelle Bedinezzi in what I'm sure will be a fascinating and amusing conversation. Also, we will be recording this webinar in case you have to leave early. We're going to be sending the link to the series page in the chat box right now. Alrighty, up next, let's get some technical things out of the way, just a little housekeeping. Please feel free to ask questions during today's session. You can do so by submitting them into the questions panel on the right side of your screen. Don't forget to stick around until the end for a Q&A session to get even more fresh insights from Adam and Michelle. My wonderful colleague, Devin, will also be fielding your questions today. He'll be happy to answer anything you might have, so pull up the questions panel and say hello to let him know that you're listening. Lastly, if you have any audio issues during today's presentation, you may wish to choose to dial in by phone. You can do so by selecting the More button in the upper right portion of your screen and then selecting the Switch to Phone option. We'll also have the dial-in information up on the screen right now. If you need it again, just ask Devin. Up next, today I'm talking with Adam Dorfman and Michelle Bettinezzi. Adam is a technology and digital marketing professional with more than 20 years of experience. His expertise spans all aspects of product development as well as scaling product and engineering teams. He has been in the SEO and local SEO space since 1999. In 2006, Adam co-founded Sim Partners and helped create a business that made it possible for companies to automate the process of attracting and growing customer relationships across multiple locations. Sim Partners was acquired by Reputation in 2018, and now Adam is currently Director of Product at Reputation, where he and his teams are integrating location-based marketing and reputation management and customer experience. Michelle Betnezzi started at the student housing business uh, as an on-campus resident assistant in 2005 while attending the University of Texas Pan American, graduating with a degree in philosophy. The student experience and the services provided by the industry resonated with her and she quickly became passionate about doing her part to make the student housing industry a great place for students. She joined Peak Made Real Estate uh, in February of 2008 and has served in many roles from leasing consultant to property manager to a member of the corporate marketing team. In her role as customer experience manager, she has built a program focusing on strategically marketing the customer experience, uh, sorry, making the uh, customer experience a great one by gaining customer knowledge that influences business decisions and ultimately results in better marketing, sales, and leasing efforts. Michelle is Texas-based, is happily married to a six-year-old daughter and a beagle, and loves the performing arts. Without further ado, take it away, Adam and Michelle. Thanks, Tom. Really appreciate it. And thanks, everybody that's uh, attended. We really appreciate you making the time to join us today. I'm incredibly excited. Having uh, spoken to Michelle quite a bit over the last uh, few months, uh, the amount of fascinating um, observations and case studies and experiences she's had uh, doing this has um, uh, has really opened my eyes. I'm just, it's amazing how much you can still learn no matter how long you've been doing this. Okay, so today we're gonna speak to a few things. Um, first off, why is customer feedback more important now than ever before? Uh, what types of structured and unstructured feedback should your team be gathering and looking for? Uh, and how can you essentially operationalize this? Like what programs and processes can you put in place with all of this data that's coming in to actually drive growth for your business? Um, uh, so Michelle, as, as uh, Tom stated, is in property management, but all of these use cases we're gonna be talking about are so easily applicable no matter what industry that you're in. Also, uh, as Devin just mentioned at the, uh, in the chat, uh, we have lots of time for questions at the end of this, um, so please, as we're speaking, uh, please ask them and we'll, we'll get to as many as we can at the end. Okay, so first and foremost, uh, feedback is, is everywhere. Uh, it's in social media, it's in reviews, it's in messaging conversations, it's in word of mouth, it's on your website, it's on other people's websites, uh, it's in survey data that you're, you're sending out. It's, it, it's incredible. The, pure quantity and breadth in which all of this feedback exists. Um, I love these examples of people. And the other thing is, is it's 
almost, uh, I just read an interesting article about how Slack is kind of flattening corporate hierarchies in the sense of employees now, no matter what their level, can have cross-departmental uh, conversations, can speak directly to the CEO if they want to. And social media is the exact same way. Um, for better or worse right now, anybody can go and reach out to Elon Musk exactly and say, or specifically and say, this is the problem um, that, I'm, that I'm having right now. This is unacceptable. Please, uh, please make this right. So it's really important that it's not just your business Twitter or social media accounts that you're looking at, um, but also employee, like feedback that might be coming in about employees and, and so on as well, too. Okay, uh, and there are risks to not managing your data. So it's interesting when we look at um, uh, when we when we look at some of the the data points that we're seeing, and these all come from Gartner, all of these statistics. But this is right in line with what uh, we're seeing with our clients as well too, which is. 22% of prospects look elsewhere after reading one negative review. So how do you deal with the negative reviews that come in? How do you mitigate that happening? 71% of customers that receive possible, uh, uh, positive social customer care, on the other hand, are likely to recommend your brand. So how can you improve that social customer experience? How can you generate those additional positive experiences and comments instead of those negative ones? And then, most interesting is, and we know this, is um, a 2% increase in customer retention has the same business impact as decreasing costs by 10%. That's massive. And keeping customers happy, and this is where customer experience and managing all of this is so important, and that customer feedback is such a critical part of this, um, that's really how it can be transformative uh, for your business, as well as very smart from a, a revenue um, uh, standpoint also. Okay, um, we have lots of stories about how feedback can, can drive growth and can drive positive experiences and reputation. But since we have Michelle uh, uh, with us today, I'd love, Michelle, if you could provide us with a, a use case. And I think this picture is, is going to tee you up for that also. Of course. So um, in our conversations preparing for this, um, to Adam's point, customer feedback can come at you in a variety of different ways. It's all over the place. And lots of times it seems overwhelming and it seems like there can be just so much to gravitate towards. And how do we decipher that or where do we start? And so this example, and I know it seems like such a random picture of like a study area, we do a lot of student housing. Um, but there's a story behind it. So in preparation for this, we were talking about different instances where Peak or our team has used customer feedback to make decisions, whether they're big or small, to influence the customer experience. And so we started talking about one of our properties that uh, the team was absolutely on top of it with ensuring that they had open lines of communication with their residents, with their prospects. It was a new development. And so um, they were very engaged with making sure that any prospect that toured um, communicated with them what they were looking for, if there was anything that they needed in order to make the decision easier for them to sign a lease, right? We're recruiting, we're, re we're you know, trying to get new customers, we're trying to get that sale across the line. And it became a trend where in conversation, um, these prospects were saying that they love the property, everything was great, but the one thing that they wished they had was just more space for um, their learning experience, right? We want a couple of study rooms and more so into detail, they wanted more whiteboards in those study rooms. And so obviously that is something that we can't necessarily make happen overnight unless you make a lot of uh, rearrangements. And so um, they were very smart and strategic and saying, you know what, after this tour, you're gonna get a survey. And if you go and leave us a review and mention those things, we'll make sure we package that and put it together in front of the decision makers, right? The ownership group that spends the money to make those things happen. And within you know a, a month or so, they had that team had built their case and presented all of the instances where the feedback, whether it was from uh, a conversation that they had had or survey responses 
or online reviews or mentions on social media where people were saying that they loved the product, but one thing that could put them over the top was enhancements to the study rooms or additional study rooms and spaces. And at that point, it was once they presented it to the ownership group that would make that decision to adjust some of the areas in the leasing office to a study room. You know, again, they had built their case. It was a no-brainer. They added a few things, and then they were able to reach back out to those customers and continue that engagement um, and earn some really easy points on the board, right? Call them back and say, hey, remember when you told us you wanted more study rooms? Well, guess what? By the time you move in, we'll have made that happen because you told us that. And so um, you'll see that once we go through a couple of slides, uh, in the future, we'll talk about just kind of like that customer life cycle and how, you know, uh, the feedback that we, see, that we receive continues even after that initial engagement with them. And so it was just a really cool story to tell in one of those that are just like low hanging fruit, easy to say, you know, we can identify these quick trends, make fast decisions, and ultimately impact that customer experience so that they know that we listen to them and they are happy with the product. And then they, like Adam mentioned, have that experience that will make them want to refer people, tell people about your brand, about your community, and just have a much better interaction with you as a business. That's amazing. Um, I think my favorite part of that story is uh, the fact that you remember to circle back with those customers that left that initial feedback and let them know, hey, we listened and this is what happened. Because oftentimes you'll see a review or a comment or a social media post left and there's an immediate response from a business, but not the follow up. And the fact that you're following up, I think, uh, speaks volumes to how your organization is structured and how seriously you take all of this. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, so, Talking about reviews specifically for just a moment, um, this stat comes from BIA Kelsey, but 97% uh, of people read reviews of local businesses. And what's important to remember here is these reviews don't just exist on review sites anymore. They exist, they are everywhere. Um, and it's fascinating seeing how even businesses that weren't traditionally um, pulling in reviews necessarily are now starting to display them and even request them as well too. Uh, and there's this convergence of review data as well as business data appearing everywhere hand in hand. So when people are looking, what this means for all business owners is when people are looking for your business online, they are going to see reviews. They are like in like they are intrinsically tied to each other at this point. So it's incredibly important that as those reviews are coming in, again, you are listening, you're responding, you're following up whenever possible, and you're making that part of your entire um, uh, your entire listening program. Okay. Um, I am super excited about the next few slides. Uh, I'm gonna go quiet for a little bit. I'll be back on in a little bit, but uh, Michelle has brought some amazing data and things to share. Uh, so Michelle, I'm gonna hand the next few slides over to you. Um, I can't wait to, to hear about all of this. Of course, and we'll go through this slide fairly quickly. This is just a celebration of saying, you know, what happens when you do um, kind of lead into that feedback. Um, and so, Peak made real estate as a whole has made a lot of stride in, in improvements over the last few years in our online reputation by making sure that we make this a priority for our teams. And so there's a few stats on here that are really, you know, kind of key to say we have continued improving our processes around online reputation. Um, but in specific to saying, you know, last year was a hard year for everybody. And so it was a little bit of madness for a, a, a little bit, especially in the online reputation world with reviews going haywire, people expecting different things and this year too. And so um, because we hunkered down and made sure that we were continuing to use uh, online feedback uh, in whatever its form was for our teams, we actually had an extremely a good leasing season this year. About 95, uh, our portfolio occup occupancy ended up at 94%. That was up from 2020. 
We had 24 properties meet the 100% occupancy goal, which is the most we've ever had in any leasing season. So we were really excited about that. And then we also had year over year improvement in Aura scores, which is uh, if you are in the industry, you know that that's one of those lists that everybody kind of gets on a, on a routine basis. And we all kind of want to be on that. And so our, our company as a portfolio over the last few years, while we have made this a priority and you can see the like online reputation results of metrics from within the reputation dashboard, it translates outside of that, right? Obviously we want to see those numbers go up, but ultimately it's understanding how that impacts um, the things that we do outside of the reputation dashboard for our businesses. And so really the takeaway is to understand that reputation is ongoing, ever changing, and it's always evolving, but you have to approach it from all different angles to use that feedback to fuel the changes that will build a better brand, a better product for your customer. And ultimately, you know, those numbers that Adam shared at the beginning about, you know, a 2% increase in, in retention is going to save you 10% of the bottom line costs. If you as different than you saving that money, it's huge. And so Adam, you can probably switch to the next slide. This kind of just reinforces the idea that feedback comes from everywhere, right? And I think that that's probably the biggest challenge. We receive feedback in, in our industry from like prospect surveys, customer surveys, Google My Business, we have ratings and review sites, we have social media, different surveys that we do for residents versus prospects. In, uh, at Peak, we do customer focus groups that allows us to try and translate into really cool quotes because we do student housing. And so, my goodness, the quotes that we get from focus groups are a lot of fun. Um, customer care calls, you know, different students and guarantors who are the parents the feedback that we get in person, all of that is just a lot of noise until we take a moment to put that into a centralized location. In our instance, we call it customer knowledge, where we try and put reports together to identify trends, to then understand who we're selling to, who we're marketing to, and understanding what we want our brand sentiment to be. Um, and what they're telling us that they want it to be. And then ultimately that drives the conversation of how do we make these changes to reflect what the customer needs and wants. So um, we talked about this a little bit, but obviously with all of that information coming from different areas, it's important for us to kind of plug that into the customer journey. When does it make sense to ask for what? And where are we getting the feedback? And in what, in what instances are we partnering with who to make that feedback valuable, right? So in the student housing industry, in the real estate industry, anybody who is leasing, selling apartments, I kind of mapped out our journey. So we start with the search process where they're a prospect, they come in, they're a, they get a tour, they are in the process of leasing an apartment. And in, in that kind of first three buckets, we're talking about partnering heavily with the marketing team, the sales team, our learning and development team by getting the feedback of, you know, where are you hearing about us? You know, what are, what are people saying about us? How was the tour? Did people, did you like that? Is there anything that we need to do differently for our training material? to make sure that you're getting all of the information that you need, that you feel comfortable, et cetera, et cetera. Then we, move, we shift into like the operations side of the house by moving our residents in, creating a good living experience, and then looping back in to the marketing sales team to discuss like renewing. And what does that look like? What, what sort of incentives, specials, do they want? What is going well in the, in the living experience? What is going poorly? What changes do we need to make in order to better retain our customers? And then ultimately, you know, especially in, in the student housing industry, there are some moments where no matter how great of an experience, they have it comes to an end because they have to move out, they graduate, move out of town, become, you know, adults. And then we loop in our operations team again and our accounting team, like, 
what are we going to do to make sure that even after move out that resident has or a, a previous resident has a good experience right and so everywhere along the way you can lean into the feedback that you get via surveys the feedback that you get via online reviews right a survey in the search process is very different than a ratings and review after move out um, and so it's really important to kind of understand who your customer is and what they're looking for at different moments in that customer journey but ultimately say taking all of that data back to the right people at your organization because the way we look at it is that that broad line at the bottom that says really all of the departments at peak made real estate are responsible for creating a better experience because when we do that we have the better the ability to better recruit better retain better get referrals and really at the end of the day too our ownership loves it because then if we create these experiences um, we're able to push rent growth because um, one of the fun quotes from one of our focus groups was no matter uh, how much rate of actually I think it was something along the lines of like I will renew with you with a bad experience only if you drop rates really, really low. And so um, that's just, you know, money in the pocket. So conversely, if they have a great experience, they might be willing to pay a little bit extra to not move to stay with you because they know that they want to be there. That's that's amazing. Um, and uh, this all of these these uh, slides that you just went through were um, incredibly useful and helpful. Um, just a reminder that we have, uh, we're gonna start Q&A right now. Um, there's questions that have already come in. If you have extras, please, or if you have another one, please, by all means, uh, pass it along to us. And if you want to get in touch with us, we're both easily found online, either through LinkedIn or Twitter or both. Um, so after this webinar, if you ever wanna reach out to either of us, we'd love to hear from you as well. Uh, with that, I'm going to stop sharing these slides so we can shift to Q&A and let's see if this works. Michelle, can you see me? I can. It's nice to see you again. All right, great. Okay, so you talked, um, first off, thanks again for sharing all of that. That was fantastic. Uh, and your last slide leads right into the first question that I had, which is know your customer. And one of the things that I find really interesting about PeakMate is that your customers are primarily young adults in their late teens and early 20s. Um, can you speak to how you adapt them where they are leaving feedback and um, what their customer experiences uh, might be and how what's unique to them? Yeah, absolutely. And I think that I'll start off by saying that I'm very glad that we've kind of built this um, this system this program at peak that really tries to continuously understand the customer because it's really easy in the in any industry to say like i know who i'm marketing towards and this work has worked in the past and therefore it's going to work you know let's plug it in and just rinse and repeat um but one of the things that i mentioned earlier where we get focus or we get feedback from is our focus groups and we actually just went through a round of focus groups over the last couple of weeks and i have never felt more old in my life even though i feel very young um simply because we're definitely catering catering to a new generation now you know hearing the feedback that they gave who they're paying attention to you know what apps they use and you know where they find their feedback um, really kind of opened my eyes to say we we definitely did the right thing by by doing these and listening to them um, because you're absolutely right um, and our our customers are getting increasingly savvy especially when it comes to resident feedback right you mentioned that people read reviews in their search process but they also are are smart enough to distinguish like a bad review isn't the end of the world we recognize that people will leave reviews when they're really mad and so i'll read through that i'll skim through it to see if there is a trend in other in other reviews i'll read what the um the business manager responded to that and see how they're handling the situation 
uh, what feedback that I can get, and then I'll switch over to social media and kind of get the inside scoop that's different from your website. Um, I was very surprised to, to say that in every single session, um, uh, the, the, the participants mentioned Reddit and getting reviews from like subreddit threads and things like that. And I was like, oh my gosh, so I'm so glad that we have the partnership with Reputation to make sure that we're paying attention. Um, I always say that there's bound to be blind spots. And so um, having a partner that's strong enough to identify where those blind so spots are is always going to be beneficial. And so, um, I mean, to your point, we have to listen everywhere. Um, obviously, do the same things that you would do with, you know, responding to reviews, you know, things like that, but also using the social component of it, especially with students of like, well, they might not write a review on your reviews tab or on your Google My Business, but they might just comment on every single one of your pictures on social media to tell, tell you what they want you to do. And so, um, it's just, it's a lot of fun, um, but it definitely helps having a partner in your back pocket that will help you pull that information together so that you have a place to look at it. That's great. And it kind of ties into a question that uh, Lorena has. Um, once you have the insights, um, or I'm sorry, uh, I'm going to go to this one first, which is from Amy. Uh, do you recommend amassing all feedback types into one place, uh, measurement across types? And that actually like coincides with. Uh, um, uh, another question that I had, which is, and it, as you're answering how to use a tool to amass all of that feedback, can you also talk about um, Reddit is a great example, but other unusual places maybe where you're seeing feedback as well too? Yeah, of course. I mean, Reddit was a good example, but I will say to like that example of people, um, you know, commenting on your social posts where they're like, oh yeah, well, I got locked out of my apartment and nobody answered or whatever it may be. And so it's important to kind of address that in any forum, right? So, and do it publicly, let people know what you're doing to solve for the issue, circle back. Um, we also get DMs all the time. Like in, uh, in your world, Adam, I know you are on Twitter. I was much uh, different than you by putting my LinkedIn, but you're totally cooler than me because they're definitely on Twitter and you're absolutely right. Somebody might um, tag our CEO on Twitter and just say, you know, like I called, they didn't answer and now it's your problem. And half the time, you know, that our CEO will say, hey, you know, let's get this taken care of. Same thing with with uh, the Elon Musk, you know, story, right? People yeah. know that if you uh, and, and that's why it's so important. If you're not responsive, they'll find somebody who is. And ultimately, that's a representation of your property, your brand, who you are, you know, and it creates that uh, online reputation or in-person reputation because, believe it or not, word, word of mouth is still king, you know. Um, and so it, it will create that dynamic of what what your your brand, your personality is consistently. And so it's it's so much easier to just identify and then work fast, right? Speed, speed to action is gonna be your best friend. Um, but then, you know, even if it's just like, okay, I acknowledge it, let me go ahead and look into that and then follow up. Um, that's super important too. So in a, in a digital world, it's all about how quickly you can get to it. Yeah, 100%. Uh, um, that's one of the, the rules, quote unquote, that we tell all of our customers, which is for, especially for negative reviews, uh, you have essentially a 24, maybe a 48 hour window to quickly respond, even if not resolve, and just acknowledge that you heard what they had to say in order to transform that into a end positive um, experience. One quick question I have before we get into tools, because I, I do want to go there, is, um, Speaking with you, it reminds me of senior living customers that we have where the end customer is a decision maker, but a lot of times the, the children 
of the person going into a senior living facility are big influencers in that decision making. Does the same thing happen with student housing and how do you address student concerns versus parent concerns and all of that as well too? Yeah, um, I actually love that question too because a couple of, well, like one or two years ago during our focus group sessions, we asked that question like, how much influence does your parent have in your decision making process and your renewal decision process or et cetera, et cetera. And the feedback was overwhelmingly like, my parents think they're the decision maker and they might fund this, but um, I feed them the information that I want, right? Like I narrow down my options and then I give them the information that I want them to sort through. And ultimately whatever they pick is one of my options type of thing because they've already narrowed it down. Um, but they also say, you know, the, the very human side of it was like, yes, my parents pay the bills sometimes in a lot of instances, but I'm the one living there. Like this is my home. And so I want to be treated like an adult. Like if I call you with a concern, I want it to have the same level of importance as if my parent calls and gives you that same feedback, right? And so um, you kind of have to treat both customers in with that same respect, you know, understand that, you know, they're both in the decision making process, they both are investing in your community and your in your product. And each of their concerns whenever brought to you, no matter what it is, is valid. Um, and even the human side of the student part of it is like we want you to treat us like adults but also know that this is our first time being an adult so bear with us give us some grace because some of the questions that we might have you might think are like common day but for us it's the first time we're experiencing it and so I love those as much as the data that I grab from all of these I love listening to those stories because it does give you that background of like okay I am dealing with ratings and reviews. I am doing dealing with these metrics, but at the end of the day, there's such a valid reasoning for each of these, no matter what, how ridiculous the review or how ridiculous the comment or how many times they post that comment, it's coming from a very valid place. And that definitely helps us take a moment to like step outside, especially with like the bad reviews, right? Step outside for a second and then say like, okay, I have to approach it from this way in this manner. That really makes sense. All right, thanks for sharing that. Okay, so let's get a little tactical here, which uh, feeds right into Amy's question, which was, do you recommend amassing all the feedback types into one place? And how do you measure across different types of feedback? Yeah, so um, we partner with a couple of different um, businesses or vendor partners to, to get all of this feedback, right? And so we definitely amass this from a lot of different areas into one. One of the biggest ones being reputation, right? Because we subscribe to like ratings and reviews, the social component of it, um, where we get the feeds and feedback and where we're able to pull a ton of reporting that allows us to see those trends and measure ourselves month over month or year over year. Um, and then we partner, partner with like a survey vendor, or um, our teams, our customer care team who handles calls to the customer uh, care line um, and things like that. And on a monthly basis, we just kind of consolidate that. It's really easy to kind of overlap the reports by location and see the differences in scores. And you know, the numbers are what help you tell the initial story. And so you'll be able to see like this property went down X number of points and it seems to be a trend because the survey feedback also showed a downward trend. Um, they definitely received an increase in customer care calls or X, Y, Z. And so then you can take the time to kind of engage specifically, right? So we, we notice these high level trends. Let's dig a little bit deeper. Let's pull a couple of different reports that show a little bit more insight let's have a meeting with the team with and include the regional manager include the regional sales manager figure out what's going on and then come up with a plan of action to improve or conversely you know the high performers what is it that you're doing how can we get that feedback in 
in a, a good place that we can hopefully implement across the board if it's a broad enough measure. That's fantastic. And it, it, you almost answered what was uh, going to be the next question that I had queued, which was, um, uh, you know, that study room example was a really great, uh, I just, I love that so much because it was you listening, um, I assume across multiple locations and saying, mm -hmm. oh, this is a trend that's happening across multiple locations. Um, you know, how, and maybe you just answered it, but maybe there's like a, something else that you can go into here. But uh, one of the things that I was wondering was with this endless flood, like I, I wrote stream, but really it's like a flood of information <laughs> and feedback coming in. How do you pick and choose what it is you should be, you should be focusing on and that you do want to put your attention on too? Yeah, so I'll say that, um, one of the things is is understanding like where you are with the customer you know customer process but also the process for your business right in student housing it's very cyclical um because you know you have the lease up you have the move out you have the move-ins and it's just one big circle but then you also have to understand your product in specific markets right so uh in the example of the study rooms it was a lease up that property was under construction. And so it was easy to identify the smaller things like if we if only we had you know whiteboards or a different study room, we'd be happier, right? Um, and so that was easy to identify, but that wouldn't be that probably wouldn't be the same thing in a property that opened two years ago that is right now, you know, dealing with a different thing. Um, and for in those instances, we'd probably pay more attention to, you know, the experiences and the interactions with the staff because we're about to get ready for renewal season, right? And if they're having terrible interactions with the staff, then we need to better train them. We need to figure out if we need more staff. What are we gonna, what are we gonna infuse in the situation that will, that will matter to the customer, but also influence where we are in that customer cycle on our end, right? So um, same thing for like move outs, right? We're about to get ready for people to move out or move in. What are they saying? And sometimes it's not a, a review, right? But like, are people saying that they're excited to move in or are people saying that they're worried because they haven't gotten enough information, which is a valid concern, you know? Um, and if they're saying like, oh man, I'm moving in in 30 days, but I don't know who my roommates are. Well, then we need to ping the, the property and say, hey, have you communicated who roommates are? Have you communicated what they need to bring in? And so it's just kind of, I know that it sounds like you're picking and choosing, but really it's understanding where you are and what the biggest need is at the moment for those customers. It's really interesting. So essentially it sounds like it's a combination of knowing your business really well and the cycles of your business and then looking at the feedback as relates to how it's going to relate to whatever cycle that you're in within your, your business. Yeah, yeah awesome. and I mean, okay. I, I, I also hate saying that like, the loudest wheel gets the oil, right? But but it's true too. Like in in case of a an emergency, right? Like if you don't know where to look, look at the loudest thing first. So there's yeah, that. it happens. It happens uh, for sure. No matter what business that you're in. Okay. Um, <laughs> all right. So I'm gonna shift to um, uh, to Lorena or Lorena's question. Apologies if I got your name incorrect. Which is um, once you have the insights from the customer, how can you effectively monitor and ensure that other areas of the company are committing to act on those insights? So this is spot on and in line with the question that I was going to ask you if nobody else did. And uh, when I think about uh, the role of somebody listening to customer feedback, um, it requires you to work across departments and to um, know your entire organization or else as a marketer, you're saying one thing and the company's doing something completely different. So um, how do you effectively do that? Who are your allies? Who are you often having to maybe gently, nicely drag along to get to what needs to happen from an operational uh, experience or like an experience standpoint so that the feedback starts becoming more positive? I'd love to hear what your thoughts are on that. Yeah, I'm gonna say something that I think is really, um, it kind of, 
the nickel hit the spot a few years ago because obviously this is not a new concept, right? We have always known that if you listen to the customer and you give the customer what they want, then you know it makes your job a lot uh, a heck of a lot easier. And so, um, as with anybody in in this capacity, it's it's it takes some some like maneuvering to make sure that people have buy-in, right? But I think. For me, it was understanding that just the same way that we talk about our customers externally, we have to talk about our internal customers. And like, I do, I never want to be that one person that's like, okay, let's just do this and you know, take my word for it or here are the stats, but really understanding what language they speak, right? Because I was over here talking about like, if we just do a better job of giving them these experiences, like the really like lovey-dovey feeling side of things, like people are just happy, you know, they want to live with us if they're happy. And then, um, you know, a couple of years ago, we're like, okay, but there's a direct quote that says we will lose money <laughs> or if they have a bad experience, we have to drop rents and our goal is to increase rents. And so then, you know, depending on who you're speaking with, it it gives them that insight that speaks their language, right? Like our our CEO or COO are definitely going to start paying attention if we say, sure, we don't have to focus focus on this, but we're going to have to drop rents. Or conversely, if we do focus on this, you can push rents, right? So now people in different departments are listening to what makes sense to them, and so. Um, using the feedback and presenting the data in a way that makes sense to the end user, to your different internal customers in different departments, um, makes sense to them, right? And maybe even if it's like slicing and dicing the information, right? So I'm not gonna go and present every single one of my reports to our learning and development team. I'm gonna present them, present to them, you know, this is the overall picture, but here's the piece that pertains to you. It seems like we need to do a refresher uh, a refresher training on, you know, the leasing process or how do we explain the lease to our customers and if we better explain this to our teams, they can better explain it to our customers and therefore our metrics over here will go up which influences this. And so um I don't think that they're over the last couple of years we've definitely built that relationship with different departments at peak so that now they understand like when we talk about it in general sessions they're like okay that affects me in some way i'm going to pay attention and then it just kind of becomes this like no longer resistance it's more so like this is making your job easier and so let's let's troubleshoot xyz super super helpful uh and thank you for that and yeah it's we see this as a product manager, in many ways, um, I'm doing the same thing where I'm getting feedback about the reputation.com product and then having to share that across the organization or our clients receive it directly from, or our uh, customer success managers um, receive it directly from our clients and then have to share that to us and uh, kind of connect all those dots. So yeah, it is always a challenge, but um, that's where you can really start fine tuning and refining what it is that you wanna, that you wanna work on and where you wanna improve. Okay, I'm gonna, um, it is Halloween season, so we're gonna go a little bit darker now and oh. talk about <laughs> negative customer, and talk about negative customer experiences. Um, so Justin said, former employees who are no longer with my company have managed poor Google reviews badly in the past with negative responses. Is there anything I can do to recover or backtrack? And I'll take this one, but I'm gonna pass it off with, um, as, as I'm talking about like what to do in this specific instance, I'd love mm -hmm. for you to think about negative customer feedback that you've received um, and what you do with it, how you receive it. You kind of went over it a little bit, but if you want to provide a very specific example, um, that would be great. So Justin, um, yeah, former employees can leave uh, um, uh, positive and negative reviews on sites like Glassdoor and Indeed and Comparably, and there's all these like voice of the employee sites as we call them at Reputation out there. Um, it's uh, I always see those sites as underrepresented when people think about um, customer feedback uh, and how to improve the customer experience. Because as often as not, that feedback coming from either existing or former employees 
comes with really good intentions. Most people are, if they're leaving negative feedback, it's because they want to see the, the company succeed. Um, the best thing that you can do is, is if the, if the um, negative review is blatantly false and comes from something that's never worked at your company before, you can sometimes work with these sites to show and prove that and have the review removed. If it is um, disparaging and dox, doxes, I think is the word the kids use, whatever, but like kind of outs people's addresses. Michelle, you probably know because you probably deal with this much more than I do. Um, uh, but if it uh, has personal um, uh, information that should be made, that should be kept private or whatever, you could potentially have it removed. But it's really no different at the end of the day, which is monitor, respond to those reviews as they come in, if possible. And most importantly, request reviews from your existing employees that you know are going to be happy. It's that same thing where um, negative reviews are going to come in no matter what the site is. The number one thing you can do is to make sure that more positive reviews than negative reviews are coming in. Because every positive review that you get, typically on um, pretty much every site, will push down the negative ones so they become less visible. Um, so it's that whole um, idea that if you are asking and actively requesting reviews, whether it's from your customers or from your employees, you're going to uncover the silent, happy majority that typically doesn't leave feedback unless they're prompted to. Um, and in this case, this would be what I would recommend. If you're not requesting reviews from your employees, I would, I would probably start there. Um, Michelle, do you have anything to add or any other negative review stories that you, you'd like to, to share with us? Um, yeah, I mean, funny enough, we have like this whole every year at our leadership conference, we put together like kind of like the angry tweets on SNL. We do that with reviews because it'll be like five star, two stars. Like the only reason I'm giving it two stars because the liquor store is close by or whatever. But I will say, um, I think I understood the question a little bit differently um, based on saying like I am. Um, kind of inheriting the the poor management from before, right? So saying like somebody left reviews, maybe positive or negative reviews, but the person who was handling online reputation or these review responses previous to me was doing a really bad job. And how do I fix that? And so a lot of it is like, go back and re-respond and say, hey, you know, I know that your review was X amount of time ago. I mean, I, I wouldn't open a can of worms if it was over a year. Usually I tell our teams like go back maybe six months if you if uh, to the beginning of the year at most. Don't go back too far. Don't don't create drama where there is none. But you're more than welcome to just say like, hey, you know, my name is Michelle. I'm the new property manager. I'm the new store manager. And you know, sorry that this wasn't handled. I want to make sure that that you're good to go now if everything was resolved if it wasn't let's talk let's fix this and then take it offline and ultimately we've had instances where a bad review can turn into a good one because you've made that continuous follow-up right like don't just respond initially and then just call it a day and say okay i've done my job i i've checked it off my list i don't have to talk to them ever again i i push that outward outward response and we're good to go. But let that con that consumer drive that conversation and continue that conversation until they're ready to put it to bed, right? And so go back and re-respond. If you have access to their information, you know, in our instances, we'll have like our resident accounts that we can call them and say, hey, you know, we saw your review. Sorry, we don't we don't necessarily need to hash this out online. I'd love to take care of it, but I did respond. Don't know if you saw my response. How do we fix this to make things better? And then you can go back and re-request that review, right? You can say like, okay, now that we've solved for that, did I do a good job? Could you go and leave a review, letting people know that I was able to help you through this situation? Um, Thanks so much. You're right. Now that I reread the question, you're, you're spot on. <laughs> And uh, it brings to mind a, a client of ours. Um, it's a Mitsubishi dealer owner, and he has something like 1,500 reviews and a 4.9 star rating. And I've talked to him at length about this because he doesn't like spam or he doesn't, you know, like every one of those reviews is legitimate. And I was like, are really like 98% of your review, reviews coming in five stars? And he goes, no, not even close. However, anytime that it's less than five stars, 
I immediately within 24 hours leave my cell phone number within publicly with the, as a review response saying, please call me so that we can make this right. And I do what it takes to, to change that. Now, that is a huge commitment. And this is a person that owns yeah. one dealership that, you know, is basically his life and blood and his family and everything. But it does go to show um, uh, that if you do listen and respond to negative reviews as they come in, and as Michelle stated, don't like if it's a review from two years ago or even a year ago, maybe that's too far. You're, you may just be opening up a can of worms, you know, like putting salt in an old wound, whatever expression you want to use. But if it's semi recent within the last three to six months, 100% like go back and, and reach out to them. And maybe if you do, as uh, Michelle uh, insinuated, maybe you don't do it publicly there. Maybe uh, uh, if it is an older one, maybe you send a private email if you have their information um, in your CRM and you uh, just outreach to them and say, hey, there's been a lot of changes here. I'd love to touch base with you and talk to you for a little bit about those changes and hopefully make you a happy customer of ours again. So I think that's great. Thank you, Michelle. I will, I will say before you go to the next question is I tell our team this all the time, like don't be discouraged by negative feedback. Like just it's part of the process and i mean candidly our consumers and probably your consumers are just as smart in dissecting the review situation to where like you don't necessarily want a 5.0 like they they do they distrust a company that only has positive reviews right even adam who works at reputation was like are those really all your reviews because that's too high you know um, and so take those as an opportunity to say like, okay, valid, let's see what we can do. And maybe that doesn't translate into you changing that to a positive review. Maybe it just, it stays, but that, but that interaction does also stay public. And so potential customers later on down the line, see that, okay, we got a bad review, but it seems like you guys we're able to work things out, or at least the company, the business, the brand did their part to try and make things better. So I'd say, you know, try all avenues, but ultimately don't shy away from that negative feedback either. Awesome. Yeah, I couldn't agree more with all of that. All right. Um, I have one more uh, question from the audience, and then I have one more final question for you. So two more, Michelle. Thank you so much for sharing all of this information. It's been fantastic. Um, okay, so first off from the audience, uh, any advice for how to handle Yelp differently? I'm gonna take a stab at this one first uh, uh, from my point of view. Like when I think of how Yelp is different than most review sites, first and foremost, they do not allow review requesting. And if you use a platform like Reputation, which highly encourages review requesting, because we see repeatedly what that means from your overall customer experience, sentiment online, total review volume, like all the metrics that you want to improve, improve with review uh, requesting. And on top of that, Yelp is really the only site that says, no, we don't like this. Um, it means that Yelp is not necessarily uh, able to, we're not able to house Yelp reviews within the reputation platform, either our um, other tools like our set enable review requesting. So the question is, is how do you handle Yelp differently? Um, Here's what I would say about Yelp. Yelp, depending on the industry you're in, can still be a very good source of feedback. And it is something you should be monitoring and doing the same thing that you would be doing um, on any other source. And if you are especially in, um, let's say, home services, in restaurants, of course, um, on the West Coast, which they seem to be much bigger in than throughout the rest of the company, um, definitely worth your while to at least spend uh, a hour or two a month um, logging in and taking a look at the reviews uh, and seeing if there's there's anything uh, there to to utilize in your feedback. Um, uh, so yeah, I think that's that's how I would recommend handling handling Yelp. Um, more and more people, like from a total review volume standpoint, Google is eating everybody's lunch. So um, I would focus primarily like on Google first, vertical specific sites like in property management, home advisor would be a great example of that um, in uh, healthcare, it might be WebMD Vitals or health grades in uh, travel, it might be uh, TripAdvisor or Travelocity. Like I, I, those vertical specific sites, way more important than Yelp. Eventually though, you're gonna wanna also kind of monitor Yelp as, as well too. Um, Michelle, would you have any, any thoughts about Yelp? No, and also for the sake of time, I won't talk too much on this one. I know I have a tendency to talk. So um, <laughs> I would agree 
<laughs> I agree with what you said, Adam. I mean, Yelp is a totally different, a different beast, as it were. But uh, you're absolutely you're very right in saying that the review volume is lower, but you also don't want to create a blind spot for yourself. So mm -hmm. depending on, you know, the engagement and interaction on for your industry or for your property, make sure that you're monitoring it. That you're, you're doing all of the same things with the exception of requesting reviews, but you could also, you know, in the, the same vein of trying to turn negative feedback into positive feedback, sometimes that conversation lends itself it's not necessarily asking for a review you're just you know changing the dynamic of that interaction with that customer and you might be able to change that that online discourse as well yeah and james had a follow-up comment seems like there is a higher barrier to entry for yelp users to post positive reviews versus google there Correct. is yelp notoriously has a very highly like syncretic whatever uh, the word is filter <laughs> to filtering out a lot of legitimate positive reviews i've seen reviews that i've left get filtered from yelp um and they were like i was there like i checked in and everything and they still got filtered it was like uh incredibly annoying however negative reviews never seem to get filtered so yeah. i'm with you uh james yelp yeah. is difficult i think less people are going to yelp as a result of this too because they know Correct. it doesn't really an accurate picture of a, of a company's business or a company's reputation. Um, so again, I would take Yelp with a grain of salt and know that it's just going to be a little difficult. Correct. Okay. Yeah. Michelle, one final question. You have two minutes, let's say, to answer this. Actually, I don't even know if it's fair to ask you this, but it's uh, it, like I find it helpful to, to think about this. Um, you have to show success throughout your organization. Can you like in a minute and a half, like what are the high level metrics that you look at to show, hey, all of this, this customer experience management, reputation management that we're doing right now, all this listening that we're doing is having uh, success, is being successful? Yeah, so we look at it at, at the metrics that we have, right? So whether it's survey data, um, review data, customer care data, we look at it year over year, uh, three months at a time, quarter over quarter, just to see our improvements. And then obviously in our industry, what are we going to compare that to? We're going to compare that to occupancy, rent rent uh, rates and increases or decreases. And we're able to compare which properties are you know, struggling to push rates, which properties are struggling to um, you know, get occupancy, get referrals, get renewals. And we're able to kind of layer those things together and tell that story. And ultimately, we know that reputation isn't the end all tell all. There's going to be different factors that play into it. But we definitely can tell a story from our perspective that will allow us to engage, to have the conversation about all those other things that need to change in order for the experience to be better and for us to be able to continue doing the things that we need to do as a business. And so... I mean, there's a lot, but ultimately that's the story that it tells because this component of it, this customer experience side of things and this online feedback or everywhere feedback that you can get influences it. And so it's it's our job for whoever monitors these things to show how it influences all these different things along your business you know, strategy and how it can improve that, those things. That's amazing and super helpful. I know a lot of people in the audience likely have to do this kind of work and have to report on it. So thanks for sharing how you um, think about that. Okay, uh, Tom, I'm gonna pass this back to you and I will pull my screen up again so that we can um, wrap things up. Here's a couple of links, but uh, Tom, is there any any uh, final anything final that you wanted to, to review? Um, yeah, I just wanted to um, point out uh, that this uh, recording will be sent out in the next 48 hours along with the slide deck so you can access these links um, and the contact information for Adam and Michelle they had up on a couple of slides. Um, but unfortunately, it looks like that's all the time we have today. Um, again, it will be sent, uh, the recording will be sent out in the next 48 hours. If you enjoyed this session or you want to learn more, uh, don't forget to check out the third episode in the series. It's scheduled for November 16th and we put the link to the landing page in the chat box. You can also find it on b2bmarketingzone.com. Um, I want to thank again our sponsor, our wonderful speakers, Adam Dorfman and Michelle Betnezzi. Um, you did such a fantastic job. We learned so much. Um, and thank you to all of you uh, attendants for attending today. Really appreciate it. Thank you and really uh, appreciate it.
conversation with Michelle. Thank you, Michelle. All right. Have a great day, everyone. Bye. Of course. Bye-bye.